Good evening, respected and dear physicians. Welcome all in today's webinar, ECG Basic and Beyond. Today, our topic is bradycardia and cardiac pacing, which will be delivered by our respected Dr. Rafi Ahmed sir. But before going on the usual pattern, today we first discuss on a very uh, sad episode that happened today morning. One of the cardiologists of Bangladesh, Dr. Tapos Bhumi from Tangail, died early in this morning. So we mourn his death. Now I request Professor M. Athar Ali sir and uh, Dr. Abdul Wadi Chaudhary sir to say some words regarding Dr. Tapos sir. And then we start the program. Athar Ali sir. घुरी आदित्य आनपति आदित्य गड़े प्राय गणपति आदित्य मैं क्लसमेट और अकाल रियल खुबी दुख जनक आज के दोपुर खबर टाइमना कार कपाले की चौधरी He has been serving in Tangail for quite a while, and he was serving there well. He was very popular in there because he always take care in giving the proper advice, proper treatment to the general bishops. And today, being a cardiologist, he died of an acute heart attack. This just means that he was actually coming from there to Dhaka for. Better treatment. He died on the way. This actually shows us that to ensure very good and proper treatment in every part of this country. Tangail is a district, and at a district level where a medical college is there, if one has to come to Dhaka for proper treatment, this is very unfortunate. In future, we we'll have to have such service so that. We, when we are in trouble, we can get the proper treatment. Our our population can get the treatment. That should be our goal. That should be our motto. I'm really, really. I'm really sad, and we send our deepest condolences to his family. I don't know about his family that well. I hope somebody can say something about that. And we should be beside the family at this hour of need. Tushar, 
Philo, do you want to say something? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, tapos ke uh, I am a senior. I am a dedicated student. 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 I Problem with patient pele, I am the case partha. Then, our case partha. Then, madhe madhe. Then, I am madhe madhe kichu patient unna kiti tam. Because I am jani thi dependable actor lo. Jeta vadut sir bolen, eta our case shopshomi manha, eta ami shopshomi bolli. Jee, our dear ei cardiology sheba ta ke dhaka kendri ek ba shor kendri na rekhe, jato dur chhada no jai, tato chhadaan manushesh juno jawan nirapod, chhadaan manushesh sheba juno jawan nirapod, our dear juno akir bhabe nirapod. এই যে আমরা এই বিভিন্ন রকম একাডেমিক প্রোগ্রাম করি এই সিজি প্রোগ্রাম ইকো প্রোগ্রাম অন্যান্য প্রোগ্রাম করি এই সবগুলা প্রোগ্রাম আমার মনে হয় এই লক্ষ্যকে উদ্দেশ্য করেই করা যে দেশের সারা দেশের সব মানুষকে সব কার্ডিওলজিস্টকে সব ডাক্তারদেরকে এই কার্ডিওলজির ইমার্জেন্সি সম্পর্কে এট লিস্ট একটু জ্ঞান দান করা এই একটু সতর্ক করা যে এই জিনিসগুলা হলে যেন আমরা সব সহজে ব্যবস্থা নিতে পারি আমরা তাপসদার বিদেহী আত্মার Mongol Kamana Kuri, Unar Stri Amijotu Jani again doctor, Chele made the Shampo Kamijaina, Ashakuri, Tarai Shok Shamli with the Pagan. Amik to Bolte Tachi Tapur Dashum, Amade Sole Agbosopori, Hokin to Pore di Camera Exate, Unar Thesis Partir Shoma, NACBT, she should be a class of Exate Kuri. তো আসলে সত্যিকার অর্থে খুবই মর্মান্তিক উনি দুই দিন যাবত কিন্তু ওনার চেস্ট পেইন অনুভব করছিল কিন্তু উনি ওইভাবে জিনিসটা প্রকাশ করেননি বা হসপিটালে ভর্তি হওয়ার জন্য আসলে তখনই যদি ভর্তি হতেন প্রপনি নায়নি কি রেইস ছিল যেদিন কালকে এক্সপায়ার করলো তার আগের দিন থেকে গতকাল আর কি আসলে আমি মনে করি উনি আসলে একটু সেলফ নেগলেক্টেড হিসেবেই এটা হইছে আর কি এরপরে যখন প্রচন্ড ব্যথা হয় এরপরে তার বাসা থেকে টাঙ্গাল প্র্যাকটিসও করেছে সে কিছুটা ব্যথা নিয়ে পরে যখনই করতে পারে না রাত্রি 9টার দিকে সে মির্জাপুর থাকেন ওনার ওয়াইফও থাকেন মির্জাপুরে ওনার ওয়াইফও ডাক্তার ইয়ার ম্যাটার কি রংপুর মেডিকেল থেকে পাস করা মুনমুন ম্যাডাম দের ইয়ার ম্যাট বা গণপতি দা আমাদের এখানকার হেড অফ দা ডিপার্টমেন্ট আতার আলী স্যার যেটা বললেন তাদের ইয়ার ম্যাট রংপুর মেডিকেলে চাকরিও বেশি দিন ছিল না এক এক বছরের কিছু সময় আছে হয়তো চাকরি অ্যাসোসিয়েট প্রফেসরের ইয়ার লিস্টেও ছিল ওনার নাম সেই হিসেবে আসলে পরবর্তীতে ঢাকা যাওয়ার পথেই আসলে মিস অ্যাপটা হয়ে যায় আর কি তো এটাও খুবই জরুরি একটা ই ছিল যে সে যদি সাথে সাথে ভর্তি হতো টাঙ্গাল মেডিকেল কলেজেও প্রথম দিকে টেক কেয়ার নিত তাহলে হয়তো এই দুর্ঘটনাটা হয়তো ঘটতো না আর কি তো যাই হোক ওনার বিধেয় আত্মা চির শান্তি কামনা করছি আর ওয়াদুদ স্যার যেটা বললেন আসলে ইচ এভরি হোয়ার এভরি কর্নার এভরি মেডিকেল কলেজে আমাদের ওই সেটআপ থাকা দরকার থাকলে সবার জন্যই সুবিধা নট অনলি ডক্টর প্রত্যেকটা মানুষের জন্যই সেবা যেটা অ্যাকচুয়ালি পাওয়া দরকার আর কি সেটা যেন আমরা পৌঁছে দিতে পারি সেটাই আসলে আমাদের মোটো थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच আমি একটু অ্যাড করতে চাই ওয়াদুদ এবং गोविंदের সাথে প্রথমে আমি খুব গভীর সমবেদনা জানাচ্ছি ডক্টর তাপসের এই স্যাড ডিমাইসের জন্য এবং তার পরিবারের প্রতি যেটা আমি অ্যাড করতে চাচ্ছি সেটা হলো যে প্রায়ই রোগী পাই আমরা যে ডিস্ট্রিক্ট লেভেল থেকে অথবা সেই ডিস্ট্রিক্টে হয়তো মেডিকেল কলেজও আছে ওখান থেকে রোগীগুলো চলে আসছে পাঠিয়ে দিচ্ছে ঢাকায় যে আপনারা ঢাকায় চলে যান হার্ট অ্যাটাকের ইসিজিতে ডায়াগনোসিস হলে যেটা ওনারা ওখানে অ্যাটলিস্ট सर्वोच्च चालू कर তারপরে তবে জামিল কোন একটা ক্যাথলে কন্টিনিং কোন একটা হসপিটালে সেটা ডিস্ট্রিক্ট লেভেলে অনেক জায়গায় ক্যাথলে এখন আছে পুরানো মেডিকেল কলেজ সবগুলাতে ক্যাথলে আছে এর যে কোন একটা নিয়ার বাই একটা হসপিটালে পাঠানো উচিত 
জামিল আমার মনে হয় যে আমাদের গোবিন্দ যেটা বললো এটা আসলে তাপসের বিষয়টা একটু আলাদা এবং ভেরি আনফরচুনেট ধরে সিমটম হওয়ার পরে সে কোনো ট্রিটমেন্ট জানে আমি জানি না সম্ভবত সে বোধ হয় এমার্সি পার্ট ওয়ান করছিল কিনা জানি না এরকম সে একাডেমিক একজন যাক পরবর্তীতে হয়তো বা টাঙ্গাইলে গিয়ে সে খুব ভালো প্র্যাকটিস করতো এবং সাংঘাতিক সার্ভিস দিত এবং লাস্ট অফ অল আমি জানি না হয়তো বা পেশেন্টের ডিমান্ডেই সে হয়তো বা এরকম অবস্থাতে সে মানে প্র্যাকটিসটা কন্টিনিউ করতে কিনা জানি না তো এটা আসলে রিয়েলি ভেরি আনফরচুনেট আর আমার মনে হয় যে সবাই যেটা বললো ওয়াদুদ ভাই যেটা বললো এখন এটা আমাদেরই বলার কথা আমরা স্যার বলবে এটাকে সেটা হচ্ছে যে আসলে প্রত্যেকটা দুইটা যেটা জামিল যেটা বললো সেটা হচ্ছে যে অ্যাওয়ারনেস যে আসলে এটা করা উচিত আর ওয়াদুদ ভাই যেটা বললো সেটা হচ্ছে যে এই ফ্যাসিলিটিস থাকা উচিত এই দাবিগুলো এখন আমাদের সবারই আসলে করার সময় আর আমি যতটুকু দেখেছি যে শুধু বেড়ানোর জন্য কনফারেন্সে সে কোনো সময় যেত না সে মনোযোগের সাথে পার্টিসিপেট করত এবং সে খুব মেটিকুলাসলি মানে যেটা আমাদের যে জ্ঞান আহরণের যে চেষ্টা এটা আমি তার মধ্যে দেখেছি আর একটা জিনিস হচ্ছে যে আমাদের এই যে রুগী ট্রান্সপোর্ট করা ঢাকার বাইরে থেকে আমাদের ট্রান্সপোর্টেশন সিস্টেমটা কিন্তু খুবই খারাপ আপনারা সবাই জানেন ডক্টর তাজবিরুল ইসলামের কথা পালমোনোলজিস্ট এখন উইসকনসিনে আছে জামিল আর আমার ইন্টার্ন ছিল সে আর ওয়াদুদের সাথে ওয়াদুদের এক বছরের জুনিয়র তো তার একবার হার্ট অ্যাটাক হয় এবং হি ওয়েন্ট ইন টু ভিএফ এবং তাকে অ্যাম্বুলেন্সের মধ্যে তাকে ডিফিব্রিলেট করা হয় এবং হি সার্ভাইভড এবং সে ডিফিব্রিলেট করে তাকে প্রাইমারি পিসিএ করে এখন সে খুব একটা অ্যাক্টিভ লাইফ লিড করছে সে আমাদের বিভিন্ন রকম আমাদের দেশে এই কোভিড সিচুয়েশনে খুব মানে যথেষ্ট সে তার প্রাণ রেখে আছে হ্যাঁ তো আমার মনে হয় যে এই যে ট্রান্সপোর্টেশনের যে এটা আমাদের একটা সামাজিক আন্দোলন হিসেবে আমাদেরকে আমরা মনে হয় যে আমরা কার্ডিওলজিস্ট এটা একটু নেতৃত্ব দেওয়া যে রুগীকে সেফলি ট্রান্সপোর্ট করা যেটা জামিল বলেছে হ্যাঁ কারণ আমাদের আসলে পেরিফেরিতে আমরা যতই বলি যে কার্ডিওলজি সার্ভিস প্রোভাইড করা হ্যাঁ এখন তো দেখা যায় যে টাঙ্গাইলে হয়তো সেই একমাত্র কার্ডিওলজিস্ট আর হয়তো বাকিরা তার সবাই তার জুনিয়র তো যারা অ্যাপেক্সে যারা আছে তারা যদি কোনো সময় অসুস্থ হয় তাদের কিন্তু চিকিৎসা পাওয়ার সম্ভাবনাটা অনেকখানি কমে যায় তো এই জন্য আমাদেরকে একটা আন্দোলন হিসেবে এটা নেওয়া দরকার আর আমাদের এখানে একটা জিনিস হচ্ছে যে যারা আমরা ইন্টার্নশিপের সময় বিদেশে যেটা নিয়ম হচ্ছে যে বিসিএলএস এবং এসিএলএস কোর্স করে তারপর ইন্টার্নশিপ শুরু করতে হয় আমাদের দেশে কিন্তু কোনো ইন্টার্ন আমার মনে হয় বিসিএলএস এসিএলএস কোর্স করে ইন্টার্নশিপ শুরু করে না এবং সিসিউতে মাত্র সাত দিনের জন্য একজন ইন্টার্নকে প্লেস করা হয় তো সে তার নিজের পরিবারের লোকজনকেই তো সে চিকিৎসা দিতে পারবে না হ্যাঁ তা আমার মনে হয় যে আমাদের এই সামাজিক আন্দোলন হিসেবে এই জিনিসগুলোকে আমাদের একটু আমার মনে হয় চিন্তা ভাবনা করা দরকার এবং আইপিডি এর পক্ষ থেকেও আমার মনে হয় যে এটার একটা আমার মনে হয় যে একটা উদ্যোগ নেওয়া দরকার এবং তার ফ্যামিলির আমরা একটু খোঁজ খবর নিয়ে যে তার কে যদি মোরাল সাপোর্ট তো দিতেই হবে প্লাস যদি তার কোনো আর্থিক সহায়তা তার ফ্যামিলিকে করার যদি কোনো সুযোগ থাকে আমার মনে হয় এটাও আমার মনে হয় আমাদের একটু এক্সপ্লোর করা উচিত কথা বলবো মানে লাইফের দুইটা জিনিস আছে হোয়াট ক্যান হ্যাপেন অ্যান্ড হোয়াট ইজ অ্যাভেলেবল বাংলাদেশে মানে খালেদ মহসিন যেটা বলল যে অ্যাম্বুলেন্সে ডিফেব্রিলেট করা হয়েছে আমেরিকাতে এটা অ্যাক্সেলেন্ট অ্যান্ড ওইটা আমরা আন্দোলন করতে পারি পাঁচ বছর পরে ইউ ক্যান অলসো মেটেরিয়ালাইজ দ্যাট বাট হোয়াট আর ইউ গোয়েন্ট ডু ইন দি নেক্সট ফাইভ ইয়ার্স আমি জামিলের কথা আমি যেটা বলতে যাচ্ছি সেটা হলো কি এক নাম্বার আমেরিকাতে একটা প্রোটোকল আছে যে যখন কোন একটা রোগের অ্যাকিউট এমআই হয় পেরিফেল কোন ডাক্তার যদি একটা এসিজি করে দেখে অ্যাকিউট এমআই আমাদের কাছে এটা ফ্যাক্স করে আমরা তখন ক্যালকুলেট করি যে ক্যান দা পেশেন্ট রিচ এ ক্যাথ লাভ উইদ ইন নাইনটি মিনিটস 
if they cannot reach within 90 minutes, then we recommend that they should be given thrombolytics. It is a very simple protocol that Bangladesh implement And it is true also for any third world country, including Nepal and India. Second, it will be very, very nice. You create a call schedule. Call schedule to keep a vegeta amadirache. The Amra action doctor every day on call. And anybody can reach us. There is a reaching modality. It is a Shadam Dunia Shabaka di Devotana. Kin to Doctor Rajan Be, the A Doctor Shangami Aidin consult Kurte Barbo. Akon Monocolam, my machine actor Rugir at a problem, we say. So there is a problem somewhere in my machine, and he calls Dr. Wadud Chodhuri. Wadud says, that, okay, uh, send me the ECG, and it is very simple to send it by a text. And then he can say, well, listen, just give thrombolytics. I know the physician in my machine knows the treatment, but uh, reinforcing from somebody from Dhaka or is always helpful. Even it cannot be from Dhaka. Maybe in my machine, there are two cardiologists. And I'm a little confused what to do. And I can send it to my colleague. And he says, give me, give thrombolytics. We are reinforcing. So this actually you should think as a society, cardiac society or the cardiology community. Yet Dhaka-based cardiology is fantastic. It is as good as anywhere in the world in Bangladesh. So the peripheral cardiologists, if they can reach, peripheral primary care specialist, medicine specialist, if they can reach the cardiologist, the, the problem of, I mean, of Bangladesh, and of course, I'll give you a political background. I was talking to somebody from Calcutta, and he's a cardiologist in India, and now a practicing cardiologist in Bangladesh, in America. He says, patients in Kolkata dislikes cardiologists in Calcutta. Why they are not reachable? They go to Bombay. Same complaint comes from patients in Bangladesh. So everybody is looking for somebody else. But the question is, availability is important. One of my friend died in Russia Medical College. He was a retired army major, physician. He had an acute MI and he was in Russia Medical College on telemetry monitor, nothing being done. And he died exactly on day three when he's supposed to die of ventricular arrhythmia. If somebody made a phone call to Dhaka, he could have been transferred to Dhaka, he could have got an angioplasty. So I think, yes, we are talking about knowledge, technology and everything, but I think one of the conversation that you all need to do is to make this, whatever is available in Bangladesh, available to us. Remember, we may criticize Bangladesh's healthcare as much as we want to, but Bangladesh actually has one of the best healthcare in the world, I'm not comparing with United States, I'm not comparing with United Kingdom or Germany, but compare with Thailand, compare with Cambodia, compare with Sub-Saharan Africa, we have one of the best healthcare in the world. And I, what we need to have a conversation is to make it available and, and, and the communication. So please do that. And I think it, as a society, if you could do it, that would be great availability of this knowledge. And just one phone call, text, and other advantage Bangladesh has as one of the best communication system in the world. Internet availability, cell phone availability is, valid, is available in the villages. A, 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 a village doctor can do an ECG and, and text it uh, to a cardiologist in, in Dhaka. It will do two things. One, it will do uh, patient care. Secondly, it will spread your goodwill. It will also be good for your business because you will get more patience. All right? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I think I'm, I'm a little delayed today. Shall we get started? Yes, yeah. sir. I'm going to have the to buddy. Okay. My, my lecture today will not be uh, very long. Um, we'll talk about pacemaker indications. I mean, most of it is well known. I'm going to go over the major features and recent changes and recent change, not much of a change, but change of mindset. So pacemaker indication classification, and this classification is 
I, this is more for the junior doctors. It is universally accepted uh, for any modality of treatment. That means class one indication means that any modality of treatment, there is scientific evidence and there is general agreement amongst physicians that this treatment modality is beneficial and not harmful for the patient. Class two indication, there is divergence in opinion, but in class two A, the weight of evidence and opinion is mostly in favor. So if we ask 10 physicians and look at literature, there is enough evidence that this is beneficial. And class two B, yes, there is beneficial, but not well established, but we all believe that this is helpful. And class three, this is also a very important part that this modality of treatment is unnecessary and can be harmful for the patient. And I think this can be applied for um, pacemaker. This can be applied for uh, use of a beta blocker. Or we can talk about, we are just talking about thrombolytics. It can apply for thrombolytics also. Please remember this classification um, of uh, any indication or modality of therapy. So, um, age guidelines. So there are a few highlights. And, and this is interesting that in 2018, they highlighted one, this issue that nocturnal bradycardia should prompt screening for sleep apnea, but itself is not an indication for permanent pacemaker implantation. So they felt it so important that they put it in one of the 10 highlights. This is not only a problem for Bangladesh, it is also a problem for us. We see it all the time. In Bangladesh, you see it less because there is less telemetry monitor, but we see it more. So this is important that if somebody has nocturnal bradycardia, then it should prompt screening for sleep apnea, but it is not an indication for permanent pacemaker. Second, sinus nose dysfunction, there is no established minimum heart rate. This is important. Everybody asks me, what is low heart rate? Or there is no established pause duration where permanent pace may be indicated. But we have to establish the relation between symptom and the bradycardia. That is important. So if somebody has a pause of four seconds during sleep and no symptom, that's one way. Another indication is somebody has a pause of 2.5 seconds and at the same time, had an episode of dizziness during daytime. That becomes an indication for pacemaker. So I think that temporal relationship is something that we need to establish. What else? Um, and they change this one, that acquired second degree AV block, high grade AV block, complete heart block, not due to reversible cause. This is permanent pacemaker indicated regardless of symptom. In the past, they used to say, well, they have to be symptomatic. But no, it doesn't matter. If somebody has mobile to AV block, high grade AV block, complete heart block, and it is not due to reversible cause. For the junior doctors, reversible cause will be, let's say somebody comes with inferior myocardial infarction and has developed complete heart block. That most likely is a reversible cause. Um, or somebody, um, some other cause, anything that is reversible. Second, other thing that has changed is that if the LV ejection fraction is 36 to 50%, and there is AV block which needs permanent pacemaker, and we think that the patient will pace in the ventricle more than 40%, then the preferred mode of pacing should be by ventricular pacing or his bundle pacing. Because as soon as I put the right ventricle lead, it will cause AV dysynchrony, um, uh, ventricular dysynchrony, and the EF will worsen and the patient may become symptomatic. We don't go up to 50%. I think nowadays, this is actually an underused modality, but I think it should be done. The problem is that once we put a permanent pacemaker, a dual chamber in a patient with ejection fraction of 45%, we don't know which way the patient will go. Some patient will do very well. Um, the other thing I do um, is that I sometimes will do um, uh, septal pacing. That is a little bit better than um, just doing RV pacing. Sinus node dysfunction, there are reversible causes of, um, sorry, I'm going to go to the, yeah. 
So there are sinusoidal dysfunction. I think when we talk about sinusoidal dysfunction, we need to um, look at the reversible causes. One is acute myoclonic ischemia or infarct. Athletic training can cause sinusoidal dysfunction. That's not pathological, that's physiological. Um, atrial fibrillation is a cause um, that what happens that somebody has borderline sinusoidal dysfunction, develops atrial fibrillation with cardiovert. That patient can be bradycardic for a few days. It doesn't mean that patient will need a pacemaker. Eventually, their heart rate can come back. Cardiac surgery. This is common uh, occurrence, valve replacement, maze, procedure bypass. There can be some bradycardia for a few days, um, and that is not an indication for pacemaker. Uh, drugs or toxin, cocaine, organophosphate, those kind of things can cause it. Bradycardia, these are reversible. Um, electrolyte, I mean, we looked at the ECG of hyperkalemia, that can cause um, bradycardia, but that is not an indication for permanent pacemaker. Sometimes what we will do, somebody comes with renal dysfunction um, and has marked bradycardia with heart rate of 30, we'll put a temporary pacemaker in until this thing resolves. Hypervagotonia, hypothyroidism is one cause that we should do. I mean, if somebody comes with marked symptomatic sinus bradycardia, we should make sure the patient is not hypothyroid. Um, hypovolemic shock can sometimes cause um, uh, bradycardia. And then hypoxemia, hypercapnia, sleep apnea, those kind of things can cause bradycardia. The other thing is infection. I removed, I put Lyme disease at the back because Lyme disease is not present in Bangladesh, but we have typhoid, we have malaria, dengue, viral hemorrhagic fever, guillain berry all these things can cause uh, bradycardia and they should be treated. So if somebody is, has fever um, and bradycardia, that's kind of unusual um, or uh, because they should be um, tachycardia. Uh, but these are reversible causes and treatable causes. The other thing is medication. These are reversible beta blockers. I'm sorry, I'm spelling is wrong. Calcium channel blocker. And there is another medicine called um, is psychiatric medication, lithium, can cause uh, sinusoidal dysfunction. Lithium is not much reversible. It can um, become permanent. So what is the definition of sinusoidal dysfunction? Uh, that's which symptoms? Sinus bradycardia, less than 50 beats per minute. Ectopic atrial bradycardia, rate less than 50 beats per minute. Sinoatrial exit block, sinus pause more than three seconds, sinus arrest, tachybrady. We always get asked, what is tachybrady? That means sometimes patient is bradycardic, alternating with atrial tachycardia, atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation. Please remember, once the patient develops permanent atrial fibrillation, they no longer fall into the category of Six sinus, sinus nerve dysfunction or six sinus syndrome. And then chronotropic incompetence, inability of heart rate to increase to meet the demand of the body. By definition, if it is failed to achieve more than 80%, sorry, this is wrong, of eight predict, that is called chronotropic. But we have to make sure that we correlate with symptom. This is a very difficult feature to prove. And then isolytic as evidence association. This is one of the features of sinus dysfunction. What can happen that somebody has marked sinus bradycardia and at the same time there is junctional rhythm. So there can be some evidence association without heart block. So these are the features, but of all these things, please remember this must be correlated with symptom. If somebody has ectopic atrial bradycardia, heart rate of 49 beats per minute has absolutely no symptom, that doesn't require any intervention or treatment, especially pacemaker. Occasional sinoatrial block without any symptom, a nighttime sinus pause of more than three seconds really doesn't matter. What is important, these features must be correlated with symptom before we decide to put a pacemaker in. Now, class one indication for symptom in patients with six sinus, sinus dysfunction, symptom directly attributable to sinus dysfunction, which most of the time is difficult. Because what happens, most of our patients come with symptoms and we find evidence of sinus dysfunction, we put pacemakers in. And the patient who develops symptomatic bradycardia as a consequence of therapy, of which there is no alternate. An example will be, let's say I have a patient with cardiomyopathy, ejection fraction of 40% or 45%. I give carvedilol maximum dose, which he needs, and I don't think I should stop that and the heart rate becomes 39 beats per minute and 
he is fatty or she is fatty. That will be a class one. This is a new addition as a class one. Um, but we have to make sure there is no alternate to that. Now, how can you prove that somebody has class one indication with symptoms? So this is one of our patients from 1993. Patient was having disease fail. I gave the patient the event monitor. And in the event monitor, he put a marker here. And then we re retrieved the ECG. As you can see, as the moment he became dizzy, he had a pause of more than three seconds. And that is what's happened that we have made it into a class one indication. And before that, you can see there are pauses. I didn't measure the timing, but looks like probably as a block. And then there is a sinus arrest here with the pause. So this is a, um, uh, this is a class one indication for permanent pacemaker implantation, and he did not have any reversible cause. So this is another patient that, Frazier, I'm going to bring this ECG presented to hospital after an episode of syncope. And when the patient came to the emergency room, heart rate was 29 beats per minute, and he was not on any medication to um, cause uh, his bradycardia. I mean, this is clearly um, a condition. Uh, uh, and you can see that is actually, it looked like junctional, but there is a P wave here um, with a short PR. It's probably a tubic atrial rhythm with a heart rate of 29. So clearly six and a syndrome with underlying bundle bank block. And class two indication, we believe, if we believe that the symptom is due to sinusoidal dysfunction and we have symptomatic chronotropic incompetence. An example will be this patient, this is actually one of my patients that had, this is a relatively young person, 50 year old male with history of syncope and wearing a halter monitor and he woke up from sleep with a nightmare feeling dizzy and diaphoretic and a pause of 21 seconds. This was most likely this was the cause of his uh, symptom. There was no daytime pause. And this didn't look like sleep apnea because sleep apnea, this is unlikely that he will have such a big pause. And then when he woke up, he was dizzy. Um, he reported that. So this was a, basically um, almost class one, but I think we consider it as a class two indication. And there is another patient that, this patient, uh, this patient came with syncope and during telemetry monitor, patient will go into atrial fibrillation and then convert with a pause. And you can see there are two conversion pauses, even though the patient was asymptomatic at this time because patient was sleeping in the morning, early morning lying in bed, but came with syncope and had other features of bradycardia and tachycardia. And we felt that this is probably a class two indication for permanent pacemaker implantation. This is not an asymptomatic patient with pause. Class 2B indication, um, there is, this is something that they added, that if somebody comes with bradycardia, has fatigue or other symptom, non-specific symptom, and we feel that this is probably sinusoidal dysfunction, but we are not sure. And then they recommend that you can give a trial of theophylline to see if the heart rate increases and symptom improves. Then at that point, you can make a decision to put a permanent pacemaker in. I, I have never used this modality, but I think it's an interesting concept uh, to use that if somebody, relatively young person comes with borderline bradycardia and you think that the patient is symptomatic, if you have in the improvement of symptom, then may consider permanent pacemaker uh, to help his symptom. Class three indication, that means we should not put pacemaker in asymptomatic sinusoidal dysfunction. I'm saying sinusoidal dysfunction, basically asymptomatic sinus bradycardia. Example will be this patient, heart rate of 40 beats per minute, 82 year old male, um, has no symptom at all. This patient should not get pacemaker. Um, I'm not going to go through this slide. These are all um, they are important. So bradycardia, the nighttime bradycardia is not an indication for my permanent pacemaker implantation. Again, to emphasize bradycardia or even short pause during sleep is not an indication for pacer. And other thing is that whenever we see a pause or bradycardia in halter monitor, we have to make sure that it correlates with symptom before we use it as an indication for permanent pacemaker. Um, this is an example of one of our patient. The patient is wearing, she is a 54 year old female, no history of syncope or presyncope. She was having frequent episode of atrial fibrillation and we gave her a cardiac monitor for 30 days for management of atrial fibrillation. 
then you can see that the pause of 4.3 seconds with two non-conducted P waves. So it can be defined as intermittent high-grade AV block. Question is whether she should get a pacemaker or not. So first of all, the time was 3.24 a.m. Now, I could not just make an assumption that she was sleeping because I had a similar patient with a long pause on cardiac monitor. And I called the patient. I said, what, why are you doing at five o'clock in the morning? And she said, Dr. Ahmed, I work at night and I passed out. So it is important that just because it happened at night does not mean that the patient was sleeping because some people work at night. This patient I called, she was sleeping at night and she had no symptom. The other feature that you look at, if you look at carefully, that you can see that this P2P interval is gradually getting longer. That is, patient is developing sinus bradycardia along with heart block, and then became tachycardia. So basically, this is very much consistent with high vagal tone. Because high vagal tone, what it will do, it will slow down the sinus node, can also cause heart block. And of course, I called the patient and had no symptoms. So this patient does not need pacemaker, clearly. So there are a few other things that, uh, sorry, um, with um, heart block, class one indication, acquired second degree, um, uh, Mobis type two, high grade or third degree AV block without any reversible cause is a class one indication for pacemaker. Neuromuscular disorder with conduction disorder, such as second degree heart block, complete heart block, this is of course an indication here, but HV interval of more than 70 milliseconds during cardiac electrophysiology study, they should get a permanent pacemaker. Permanent atrial fibrillation with symptomatic bradycardia. Basically, patients have developed heart block. And symptomatic AV block due to therapy for which there is no alternate. Like an example will be that I have patients who get beta blocker with atrial fibrillation. If we stop beta blocker, they become extremely tachycardic. We give them small dose of beta blocker, they become extremely bradycardic, almost uh, like complete heart block. Those are the patients that should get permanent pacemaker without stopping the medicine. And there are a few other conditions, infiltrative cardiomyopathy, sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, uh, with Mobis 2 AV block, high grade, but they should be considered for pacemaker with or without defibrillator. Like if somebody has cardiac sarcoidosis, we would put defibrillator. Cardiac amyloidosis, probably just pacemaker. It's interesting that the more MRI we are doing nowadays, we are identifying more of these cases. It's like anything that when we were medical students, we never saw myocardial infarction. Everybody had peptical perforation and died within 24 hours. And I can guarantee you that all those patients had acute myocardial infarction dying with, with uh, and then when you have the modality of treatment, you find these cases. There is another issue that patient with first degree AV block, Mobis type one AV block, is it an indication for pacemaker? Sometimes it can be type 2B. Recently, I had a patient who had Mobis type one AV block, went for an intervention, interventional cardiologist said, look, patient developed two to one heart block on the table without any medicine. We just didn't believe, then we did an EP study. Sure, we found that there's significant AV conduction problem with prolonged HV. But if we want to pacemakers in this patient, you have to carefully prove their relationship with the symptom. I will not take lightly to put a pacemaker in patient with Wenke IV block unless I can prove that there. One of the way to do it is to put them on a treadmill. If you put them on a treadmill and their AV conduction improves, that patient doesn't decide. A lot of times you will see that as soon as they walk on the treadmill, they will have higher grade AV block. Then they may need a pacemaker. Class three indication, that means we should not put pacemaker in asymptomatic first degree AV block, asymptomatic type one. And other thing is that AV block is likely to resolve. In America, there is a common, in Maryland, where I live, Lyme disease is a common problem. And what we do, anybody young coming with complete heart block, we will definitely do a Lyme titer to make sure they don't have Lyme disease because Lyme disease, once you give antibiotic, their symptom improves. Now, bifascular and trifascular block, they have changed the criteria that if they have syncope, bundle branch block with HV interval more than 70 milliseconds, they should get a permanent pacemaker. And then alternating bundle branch block, 
patients should get permanent pacemaker, irrespective of symptoms. It's interesting. This is a patient that is one of our patients that in October 25th, you see that IVCD of left bundle type. And then this is October to same day, develops right bundle branch block. So, and left anterior fascicular block, PR interval is borderline prolonged. So basically bifascicular block. Look at what happened to this patient next day. Uh, uh, same day, uh, later on, develop complete heart block. So to the extent that we had to put a temporary pacemaker in this patient. So that proves that patients who alternate between right bundle, left bundle, they're at higher risk. Of, so if somebody has uh, both right and left bundle, they should be considered for permanent pacemaker implantation. Um, class three indication, asymptomatic fascicular block without AV block. That means if somebody has first degree AV block, right bundle, left anterior fascicular block, no symptom at all we should not put pacemaker. I have a patient who I've been following for last more than 15 years, and he has first degree block, PR interval of 260 millisecond, right bundle range from left anterior fascicular block, has no problem at all. We actually did the EP study, age free interval was normal, and we decided to wait. And 15 years later, he's still fine. It's not that I'm discounting it totally, but symptom is very, very important. We should not put pacemaker in unless patients have symptom. Neurocardiogenic syncope is a group that is very difficult uh, uh, to assess. Um, one of these uh, cardio inhibitory, you all know these things. Uh, it can be cardio inhibitor or visceral depressor. I'm not going to go over it or mix. So what will be the indication? Recurrent syncope. And then we, if we do EP study and we do cardiogenic stimulation, if there is a pause of more than three seconds, then we should consider, but you have to be careful that some of these patients, normal people can also have positive carotid sinus massage. So this is not something that we routinely use. If you feel that patient has recurrent syncope and you think clinically that it is probably due to um, carotid sinus hypersensitivity, then only you should put pacemaker in this patient. And then class two, A indication, recurrent syncope without clear probability events and with a hypersensitive cardio inhibitory response. And neurocardiogenic syncope can be an indication. The problem with neurocardiogenic syncope is that you put a pacemaker in, they have two components. One is bradycardia, one is hypotension. So if I put a pacemaker in a patient with neurocardiogenic syncope, I have to have proof of significant bradycardia or asystole, and still I will warn the patient that look, your symptom may not resolve completely. So, this is an example of a patient. This is our patient. And this is from 1995. She was a long distance runner, 24 year recurrent syncope. We put her on a tilt table. Test. Within three minutes, she develops a systole of 30 seconds. Now we have a problem because this is a young female. They don't want a lot of scar on their body. And this was 1995. Um, we, at that time, did not put pacemaker in this patient. But today, probably we will consider the patient. One of the things is that I can consider pacemaker, or I will probably put a loop recorder in to prove that her clinical symptom is also uh, with this pause. And some of these patients will benefit from pacemaker. Over the last 30 years, I have put five or six pacemaker for this condition, but those are carefully selected. This is I, this patient did not get a pacemaker. I had a patient when I was in Augusta, Georgia, she would get syncope every time she would get any medical procedure. First of all, she will get pass out when she will see any needle or IV line insertion. Then she would even have syncope. Talking about medical procedure, going to doctor's office, she will say, get so vagal, and that patient would put a permanent pacemaker in. Um, I'm going to skip that. Um, so I think that's about the, the highlights of these things. And if there is any question, I'll take it. A congenital, it's a little, a little bit elaboration on that. Which one? Congenital complete heart block. Oh, yes. I did not touch that part because I, I going over it, I realized that it, it, these topics are becoming so broad and big that when one congenital complete heart block, what we do, we follow this patient. One problem is that a five-year-old child if you put a permanent pacemaker, you have to put many as they grow older, the lead stretches. In a very young person, sometimes they have significant bradycardia and stunted growth. 
And if we can prove that due to low heart rate, we have to put pacemaker in very, very young children, uh, even though that's not my specialty. But the, in general, we should wait, try to wait. And if they have no growth problem, if they have no symptom, we should keep following them. And then what we do, we keep looking at their heart muscle function and the size. If there is any cardiac dilatation, that means that there is a problem. And that will be a time that to consider um, permanent pacemaker. The other thing is the discrepancy between the ventricular rate and the sinus rate. And recently I saw a patient who was 60 year old and she has done extremely well. And I put her on a treadmill. She could only walk for three minutes. And her sinus rate went up to 150, ventricular rate went up to only 70. And that would be a patient that even though she said she's asymptomatic, she actually is not. And she should go to pacemaker. Um, so we should, we would congenital yeah. heart block. We'd like to wait as much as possible. Thank you. Sir, I've got a question. Hello, sir. Yes. Sir. Hello, sir. We do not put pacemaker in bradycardia patients, asymptomatic bradycardia patients. Does that mean that this pacemaker has got no mortality benefit in patients who are asymptomatic? It's interesting. Pacemaker has never been shown to have mortality benefit, unfortunately. Because first of all, in sick sinus syndrome, even if we don't put pacemakers, the worst case scenario will be they will pass out. Unless they're driving, they're not going to kill themselves or swimming. So there is no mortality benefit of pacemaker. Complete heart block, nobody has done a randomized study. I'm sure if we do a randomized study with complete heart block patients, we may be able Provic to do Yes. Provic there will be no study because I think in general, people will think that this is unethical to randomize these patients. Oh yes, no question about it. Complete heart block, you cannot. And six and a syndrome, it, it is more of a quality of life issue than anything right. else. And, and, and the symptomatic bradycardia, the issue is that what is the natural history? The asymptomatic bradycardia patients, natural history, if there is no underlying organic heart disease, structural heart disease, their prognosis is generally good. But I think as cardiologists, we are obligated to look for um, the further into the asymptomatic bradycardia. If there is some, for example, somebody with asymptomatic bradycardia has aortic stenosis then these patients have worse prognosis over time. So we are obligated to investigate them. But I have a question for you. So yes. this sleep apnea and then pauses. Yes. Bangla hai boli, amar to bhoi lage. Mone hai je, tuma der pane chahiya bondu arami jagi bona. Any help? Sure. No, so I, we get panic. And yes. EP guys, I have talked to several EP guys for several patients, and you don't budge. Asymptomatic no. bradycardia pause in the night during sleep apnea, you don't say, I need a pacemaker. Why? When what? will you need a pacemaker? What? It, it, we have a very, very high threshold for this. Um, because it's, it's like this, that it's a dangerous driver in Bangladesh driving in Chittagong Hill tracks. So we are like that with sleep apnea and justifiably. If, if you can prove they have symptoms, then only you should put a pacemaker in. And I think if you treat sleep apnea, yeah. then this, this improves significantly. Please remember, these people can also have pause during data. Yep. But every time they have daytime pause, I talk to the patient because these are big people, 200, 300, 400 pound people. They're sleeping during daytime also. So the fact that this is JTM does not mean they were not sleeping. But I, we, we will not put pacemakers in. The, yeah. that problem that we, the problem we face is somebody comes with syncope. And we think that is vesovagal syncope and has a sleep apnea. Then we are kind of stuck. But still, we try to resist. If you talk to all the AP doctors, I'm sure your AP doctor will do the same thing. Says, yes, Look, yes. this is yes. not the cause of the syncope. But, and but Rohit, what is the issue that when there is a long distance truck driver and you see this, yes. it's, a, it's a nerve breaking. I don't want to be his cardiologist. That, that's very true. That's very true. Uh, I don't know, Dr. Maskey, you understood my uh, 
my yes. Bangla yes. quote. I don't know how to translate that into English. <laughs> no, no, he understood Bangla. Must he understand no, Bangla? No, no, that, that phrase I did not understand. <laughs> I understand I, I, everything, but that quote I did not but, understand. I, I remember Khaled Moshin said something very, very interesting the other day. He said, I'm happy to treat my patient, but I don't feel good when I put a pacemaker in and the patient comes back with recurrent syncope. Exactly. What it means is that my initial diagnosis was not correct. Yeah. I, I, I treated something different. Maybe he has some other cause of syncope and I just put a pacemaker because I found a little bit of bradycardia or something that is not related to the symptoms. I think that's why we should try to do as much as possible to correlate symptom with the bradycardia or use best judgment. Please remember, we talk to each other a lot. I mean, I've been in practice for more than 30 years. I have colleagues who are young doctors, but they're young relative to me, 15 years. We talk to each other all the time. Yep. And then sometimes we say, look, maybe we should put a pacemaker in. Sir, so, I have a question, uh, sir. Yes. Hello, sir. Yes. Sir, I, sir, I have a question. Sir, after MI, there is a group of the patient. The patient had got that transient AV block, second degree or third degree, but the AV block does not persist, but the patient uh, have the uh, bundle branch block, particularly right bundle branch block. That is transient AV block followed by the persistent right bundle block. What should be this type of the patient in this category? Yeah, but, but Atari, if it is inferior myocardial infarction and it if improves, I don't think we need to do anything at all. If it is anterior myocardial infarction, then most of them are actually permanent. If they improve, I mean, the worst case scenario, what I will do, I'll probably study the conduction system to see if there is any conduction. Because if, if you have done it, let's say somebody comes to the hospital and you have done an angioplasty within 30 minutes, just like you have saved the myocardium, you have also saved the conduction system. That doesn't need pacemaker. So I think we should just evaluate those patients and look at that study, at best study the um, conduction system. Rafik sir. Yeah. Rafik sir, I, I, I have a, just your opinion about a scenario. Suppose a patient with anterior myocardial infarction develops complete heart block. He is uh, revascularized, uh, but, uh, but uh, his LV function doesn't improve that much. So in this group of patients, should we uh, wait for 40 days to decide about what to whether to put a pacemaker or an ICD, or we can put a uh, pacemaker straight away in this group okay. of patients. So, if did, did this patient get intervention? Yeah, yeah, intervention, but they because of the uh, late, uh, so not sub, the timing was not sub, uh, not optimum. So the patient LV remains. Uh, about uh, around uh, 30, uh, 35 or something like that. So, okay. okay. Okay, so I'll go back. So let's take a patient who has acute myocardial infarction and you did an intervention, ejection fraction is 30%. With a complete heart block, yeah. 30%? No. 30, 30, uh, 30, uh, I'm just making up another scenario. Ejection fraction, 30% and no heart block. So what I have to do, I have to wait for 90 days before I put a defibrillator in. Now, if somebody has normal left ventricular function, you have done an intervention, patient is in complete heart block, and you should put a pharma and pacemaker in. If now this patient, same patient has every dysfunction, uh, conduction, complete heart block, ejection fraction of 30%, Current guideline is that if the patient has the indication for pacemaker and they should get a pacemaker defibrillator combination. And that is the acceptable indication at the moment. However, you will have to consider a biventricular defibrillator because patient has LV dysfunction also with underlying heart block, either two to one or complete heart block. So this, your patient with ejection fraction 30% post intervention with heart block expected to face more than 40% in right ventricle should get a biventricular defibrillator. It's one of the newer indications. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sir, sir, if the QRS uh, complex is narrow, even then we should consider for biventricular? Well, because this patient has complete heart block or high yes, grade AV block. So yes. expect that the wording is, if you expect that the RV will face more than 40%. Yes. Okay. 
if more than 40% of the time are people. It can happen also. Let's take a patient, same patient with atrial fibrillation with marked bradycardia. And you expect that the ventricular will face more than 40%. That will get a biventricular face maker, a defibrillator. I have a question, sir. Can I can I just point point one add one yes. point? Yes. So the, if apnar the scenario gula, uh, yes. the, the scenarios you gave, the LV function is less than thirty five, revascularized yes. patient yes. not in complete heart block, but yes. we try guidelines directed therapy yes. and then reassess by the CMS rule ninety days, but yes. the original trial was dynamite uh, with the forty days that, that they did not see any benefit. We are now giving um, wearable life jacket, like a life vest, and, yes. and then see whether we buy time. In the ischemic yes. cardiomyopathy group, what yes. is your take on the ischemic versus non-ischemic? I am more in favor of giving to the ischemic. In the non-ischemic group, uh, where the EF is less than 35, with the Danish trial, I'm very reluctant to give life vest, and there are insurance issues. What is your take on this? Well, I mean, this is the, pro the this is an American legal system issue. If I have a choice, if I had no legal issue, I will not give life waste for the non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patient. You are absolutely right. But unfortunately, uh, in a litigious society, that's very tough to do. Um, and uh, we give life waste to everybody while we're waiting. Um, we wait for both group 90 days. I feel very that if somebody with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, we can probably wait longer before we decide to put ICD in this group of patients. Sir, I have got another question. Sure. The common scenario is uh, we get patients with history of syncope. At the present, he has got bifascicular or trifascicular block. And yeah. according to you, we should be correlate. We should have a temporal relation between two, these two events. But in our country, with 24 hours halter monitoring, frequently we cannot establish this relation. What should be our approach? Oh, no. If somebody has syncope and has first degree AP block, right bundle, left anterior fascicular block, there is universal acceptance that you can put permanent pacemaker in, the group, in that group of patients, provided you have no clinical suspicion of anything else. Yes. Let's say somebody was totally dehydrated or a septic in the setting of a sepsis passed out. But if you clinically feel that there is no other cause of syncope and patient has a uh, trifascicular block, then you should put permanent pacemaker in. It becomes a little more tricky when it is, let's say, somebody with left bundle bunch block and syncope. A lot of those patients, depending on the age, if somebody is 85 year old and I feel that probably this was intermittent heart block, we'll put pacemaker in. And that is acceptable. Um, if it is a younger person, we'll do EP study to look at the age interval. If the age interval is long, We'll put a pacemaker in. If the age interval is less than 70 milliseconds, we'll not put pacemaker in. But the question is, which we are we going to advocate for either of this group, the 85 year old group and the uh, 50 year old group? I have a question, uh, sir. Can we take we, we have seen uh, We have seen the, uh, so many elderly people uh, complete heart block for uh, four years or five years just. Uh, mildly symptomatic or barely symptomatic and having uh, pre syncope And in that case, uh, patient did not agree uh, to uh, uh, put pacemaker or when referred to uh, uh, improvement in the uh, consult for further consultation and did not agree. And in that group patient, uh, can we give the, uh, to increase the heart rate propenthaline or, uh, or any other uh, treatment modalities or how can we deal in this in those group of people, elderly people? A heart rate around 40, uh, 45. Yeah. Question is somebody with complete heart block with a ventricular okay. escape rate of 40 beats per minute. Those drugs are not going to work there. They will work in the AV node or the sinus node. So that's not going to be helpful uh, at all. And as, 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 uh, as we discussed earlier, your patient proves a point, and there are many patients, uh, probably in Bangladesh, with complete hard work who has lived for many years yes. without a pacemaker. So, 
So another question: after uh, putting a pacemaker uh, uh, origin in ischemic origin, uh, use of beta blocker. After uh, putting pacemaker, use of beta blocker regarding this issue. So if somebody has permanent pacemaker, um, and they should be treated like anybody else. Uh, if we, if they have clinical reason to use beta blocker, of course you can use beta blocker. There is no problem with that. Thank you. Uh, I ask a question: the less than eighty-five year old. Uh, Occasional syncope, uh, one couple episode, and I, I'm suspecting intermittent complete heart block. And as can with 50 year old, similar presentation. Yes. And considering the financial situation, can we advocate for say, uh, intermittent complete heart block, a single chamber pacemaker, VVI pacemaker for them? Well, I mean, sure. I mean, symptom, symptom wise, um, if somebody has intermittent heart block. And we have single chamber will be as good as anything else for those patients. Those patients are not going to pace a lot. Yeah. They may have, I mean, let's say somebody with left bundle, normal conduction, and during telemetry monitoring, you find three second pause with complete heart block. And you put a permanent pacemaker in that patient, they will do fine for many, many years to come. It will prevent their syncope. Mm -hmm. And then in future, if it happens that they develop complete heart block pacing all the time, and you feel that there is a significant um, uh, symptom related to just single chamber pacing, then you can upgrade it to dual chamber. It, it makes perfect sense in Bangladesh. Look, sir. Yes. Uh, 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 query in a patient with a, in a atrial sensing ventricular pacing mode, if the yes. patient develops inappropriate tachycardia, so what will be the option of uh, treatment? Actually, would you like to reprogram the pacemaker, or we can? use evabradin in this situation to reduce the sinus rate in this group of patients? Oh, yeah. So the, I have patients with heart failure who has um, biventricular pacemaker and tachycardic. Um, in those group, if I, first of all, you should use beta blocker. Maximize the dose beta blocker. I'm assuming that you have maximized beta blocker. So if somebody has heart failure, I can use metoprolol succinate or carbidolol. Uh, to decrease the heart rate. And if after that it does not improve, ivabradin is a good drug. I have a couple of patients where I've used ivabradin. Sir, I have a question, sir. Yes. Sir, I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Kundu Karasuru Jemun, sir. Yes, hi. Sir, uh, uh, just uh, uh, one week back, one of my patients attended to my OPD chamber. Uh, he had history of uh, CBG one month back, mm -hmm. and he came to me with ECG evidence of junctional severe junctional bradycardia with RBB and some episodes of disease spell, but there is no history of syncope or pacing group. What mm -hmm. could be the approach of this patient, sir? Well, I'm sure the question is, it was not heart block, just junctional bradycardia. Yes, sir. So this finding is, heart, what was the heart rate? Uh, around 37 or 38. Yeah, so this patient basically is sick sinus syndrome patient, and the patient will need beta blocker. You cannot, because the patient has coronary artery disease, the patient needs permanent pacemaker. No question about it. He has all the symptoms. He has dizziness. No, it will be a class 2A indication. Yeah. Yes, he is symptomatic. We can Excuse move. me for a second. Uh, Professor Asan sir has got some uh, ECGs. Professor Asan sir, should, uh, should I should share the screen? Okay. Uh, uh, you have the screen, uh, I mean EKGs. Yes. Let me sir. see whether, can you see my screen now? Uh, yes, yes. Yes, sir. We can see you. See okay. Your screen. Uh, all right. So I just wanted to uh, touch base one thing uh, um, from the beta blocker. So uh, I don't know if is there or not. not. The, the, the patients with the significant coronary disease and LVEF less than 35%. And then um, chronotropic incompetence or bradycardia where you really want to give beta blocker. Then the question will come in that whether you will give them uh, ICD with by V pace or not with the by V ICD. But I wanted to tell you one thing that patients with LV function preserved the beta blocker role is questionable. We actually did a publication and that was like uh, one of the top 10 of the week was that when, the, when there is 
in the era of reperfusion, if the EF is preserved, the beta blocker benefit is, is not that much that you uh, think that uh, it is. So something to think about that don't be obsessed with beta blocker for coronary disease if the EF is normal. So I don't know whether you can see this EKG. This is from just a couple of days ago, uh, no, actually November 4th, if you can look at. I request you just- Can you share the slide, please? Oh, you can see the slide? Yes, yeah, so we can see the ECG, but- uh... Slide show, slide show mode. Yeah, it is, it is slide show mode, believe it or not, but it is from a photo. So you will be struggling a little bit, but let me point out that there is- a This is a photo is from a monitor. What's that? Is it a computer monitor? Is photo from this yeah. ECG photo is from a computer so, monitor. However, we can see it. Yeah, yes. Yes, yes, better. Yes, better. Better, better. Yeah, right. Okay. I yes, think you good. can read. No, yeah. no, no. Now no. it is very good. So this is actually a, how old is this guy? He's 46 year old and coming with chest pain and STEMI was activated. And, and then the patient has this EKG and uh, what do you want to do? The ER doctor, uh, the ER doctor uh, uh, activated the EKG, uh, STEMI. Now what? What are the symptoms, sir? Chest pain. So okay, like uh, maybe a good thing that I ACA. took the name of the patient away, so it is not a problem. Okay, now, yeah. You have the eco findings, troponin and eco findings. What is the eco? Okay, so uh, yes. first of all, when there is STEMI activation in the US, we have this problem of dot to balloon. So he has been in the ER <laughs> about 25 minutes already, okay? And then I have to decide whether this is a truly a STEMI and should I take to the cath lab? And the ER doctors did not tell me much. On the way to the hospital, I asked the nurse that does he have any other problem? Um, and, and the nurse says he has a history of COVID about seven, to seven days ago. Um, and now does not have fever, but has chest pain. This patient actually has a left ventricular hypertrophy with strain. And uh, it's my assumption it can be a very likely to be a case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Most likely. Okay. And then ER doctor is saying there is ST elevations in the precordial lead B1, B2, and then biphasic T wave. So uh, he's saying there is active ischemia going on, regardless whether you call it, uh, call it, you know, this a, a STEMI or not, he should go to the cath lab. Yes. And do you want to know anything about this patient? Uh, Khaled Mosin said hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Anything else? It Anyone? Any history of sudden death in the family? No, but I tell you, one of the common thing I ask is, is this patient hypertensive? Remember, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is diagnosed, familiar hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the absence of increased afterload. That means there should not be any AS, there should not be any hypertension. This EKG can be present, and we have a large cohort of patients with end stage renal disease and left ventricular hypertrophy with uncontrolled hypertension. And, and we have a population with cocaine like use. So this patient is not renal disease, and did not have any uh, problem with uh, uh, cocaine or anything. Um, and then, I, now, yeah. Uh, I, I have one so question. Like, as this patient has got the cyst pain, that is a uh, ischemic type of cyst pain, and this is the ECG, whether you will wait for the troponin or you will uh, bring the patient to the cath lab? If yes. you wait for the troponin, two problems will happen. That uh, I will have to wait, and I lose the dot to balloon, so we will not fulfill the dot to in case it is a true problem. And then I would not get paid either. Because if I miss the 90 minutes by the hospital rule, I'm not going to get paid. <laughs> I, was very, I have one question, sir. It's very important. Yeah. In patient. 
in emergency whether uh, in STEMI patient, STEMI activation, uh, bedside echo, whether it is routinely done before uh, STEMI uh, call? Okay, so I don't use the term routine, but I don't think that doing echo ever delays the process of STEMI trias. And I tell this to the fellows that echo, bedside echo available now, that you, know, you can call the echo tech to get this, but that makes the delay. And if the echo tech is not in-house, but there in most of the yeah. hospitals, the, uh, there is bedside echo available. So you can have a look. What do you want to look for? Sir, actually this ECG does not fulfill the criteria of ST STMI. Okay. Who is this? BCCG and chest pain. If it is not a STEMI, it can be a non ST elevation. Definitely. It might be due to severe aortic stenosis or. It needs a cap. But in acute stenosis, it will not present with acute ischemia. So I think we all agree that there is the patient, there is, we need to look for the cause of hypertrophy. And it is possible that there is familial hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. How about the question of Dr. Atarbai? He's uh, saying the patient is having chest pain. At least we can compare with the previous, previous ECG if the patient does have. Previous ECG, ECG at least. has LVH and there is some T inversion, but not like this, this deep T inversions, but some strain changes there as well. But Atarva is saying the patient is having chest pain. What to do? Well, uh, uh, I like to add that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients have often uh, chest pain that simulates ischemic uh, cardiac pain. Uh, yes. And that is due to relative ischemia. It's not due to coronary artery disease. Yeah. So, so these patients great. have I mean, it is a chest pain uh, uh, and um, that get relieved by taking rest, sometimes yes. with nitrates, but some nitrates may aggravate the chest pain. Yes, yeah, so will, but, yeah. but it is but it is that the symptom is like the acute coronary syndrome, not the. I I dealt with uh, several patients with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with uh, acute chest pain, but um, uh, even I did one or two coronary angiogram; those were normal. Yeah. With so so of, uh, this patient, there was some T wave changes and. Uh, some biphasic T wave, but you know, biphasic T wave valence can be not so sensitive in LVH. Um, yeah. and, and, but in this case, uh, to answer otherwise questions, what I did, I deactivated this STEMI and then followed the troponin, did the cap, and it was a, a myocardial bridge of the LAD that we found. So it all fits in together familial hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Mm -hmm and then a myocardial bridge. So, uh, right. it, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Finding in the ECG, there's a triple T sign. The T is inverted in one and two, and it is upright in three. This also favors hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Tell us by yes, please. absolutely. The, Tell us by please a, highlight a, the point. A triple T sign. To... Triple T sign. Triple T. Yeah. One and two inversion, three upright. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and and this feature was uh, first described by uh, General Anish Weiss. Yes, and his name is in the um, uh, in the ECG book written by. Um, Actually, I don't know that uh, General Anish Weiss's name is there. Yes. But when I was a fellow, it was pointed out that this is a good sign to know. Usually, you don't see that in the L aortic stenosis related LBH. You, you don't see that. So uh, I did not know that uh, one of our uh, eminent cardiologists was involved in this. Yes. Nice to know. Um, okay, so, and actually my class friend's dad. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell her. Um, so another important case, this was, this is a, a specifically for the EP, EP a cardiologist, 22 year old, coming to our hospital with uh, trauma, multiple gunshot injury. Okay, and then vitals are you are looking at the vitals, blood pressure 240 over 128. It's a 22 year old, and then this EKG. He was tachycardic, and this EKG. 
Oh, but uh, excellent. Rafik Bey is back. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I saw it. I heard the news. Yes. Or said anything. I did not know what the hell is this. So I gave beta blocker Rafik Bhai and mm -hmm. the blood pressure was uncontrolled. I gave beta blocker like metoprolol, metoprolol, several uh, doses. And then um, I got an echo. Now, before that, we want to know the ECG diagnosis, sir. Is there any evidence of the sinus node activity, sir, in V1? Can you see the P waves, sir? I don't think so. No, it's difficult yeah, to see. If there is a P in wave, it is buried in the QRS complex. Uh, in ABL, ABL uh, with the with the ST inhibition or fast complex, there looks like a P but wave. But there is no P wave. Let, let me tell you that what problem we had. Because we had a war with this EKG among our EP guys, literally I, physical war. Uh, and one of the fellow pointed out, adding to the further pain, how about ABL? Yes. Is this ST elevation? And one of the third year fellow told the first year fellow, shut up, we are having a problem. <laughs> so I, just... I mean, the heart rate is 120, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, that two, okay, two no. possibilities. One, that is sinus rhythm, which P wave we cannot see with ventricular bigemini. The other thing that I would think of, bidirectional ventricular tachycardia. That's it. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. I thought it is bidirectional VT, but I was shot down by the EP guys. One EP guy said, this is sinus tach by Gemini. I said, no, I don't see any P wave. And then he was walking me through the P wave, which I thought, He's saying that this is the P wave. Right, right. What I, I wanted to say. I don't know that this is convincing, but it is possible. Which one, sir? Which one, sir? One second, sir. Which one is the P wave, sir? Look at the P over uh, the, at the uh, line, straight line, there, the small. In V1, there is a, some. some yeah. Yeah. Listen, we, we, can, we can imagine P wave. But that imagination, but that imagination, no, but the imagination must be substantiated by other means. That means we have to see something similar in other leads. Here, there is nothing to compare with. Yeah. So, yes, it's a possibility sinus rhythm with bigemini, but I will consider bidirectional VT because that exactly looks so like. The cause of bidirectional VT is catecholamine yes. induced, like. Uh, uh, like polymorphic VT, right? Most likely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Polymorphic ventricular the, And this is the echo. So, I don't, I don't have all the full study, but look at the basal part. Basal part moving much better than the whole apical and epical septal wall. So uh, this to me look like uh, the uh, uh, epical ballooning type with high catecholamine state. So I, any comment? Yeah, so yes. to cut this story short, uh, this patient was uh, uh, treated with beta blocker and all that, and about day eight, the LB function normalized. Uh, I had another patient, which is actually works in my department. He came in with Takasubu picture, and then we cat, blood pressure a little uncontrolled, and everything good, LB function normalized. And then he had a surge of hypertension about a year later, I did a belly pain, I did a CT, adrenal mass, pheochromocytoma, which I missed in the first time. That, and so high catecholamine state, and we are now learning from the COVID time, high cytokine level 
cytokine storm, adrenaline storm, all these can give uh, the uh, stunning of the myocardium. And hold your breath, uh, follow up the patient, and then they will come back. Um, this is a 69-year-old, came in with history of fall. And this is uh, the vitals in the emergency room. Uh, and this is the EKG. Why did he fall? I have no idea. Well, fall <laughs> doesn't mean anything. Well, can we, did he trip? So this is the reason I'm asking this question that as a doctor, it's my job to ask why did the patient fall? I always ask them that number one, did you pass out? But old people cannot tell that they passed out because they don't know they passed out. I asked them then, could you see yourself falling down? And they said, no, I could not see myself. I just are standing next thing. I know I am on the ground. So, so that's important. In England, they, they differentiate very nicely, like a drop attack or syncope. In US, we try to stick to the definition that there is transient loss of consciousness with full neurologic recovery and no evidence of, uh, uh, no evidence of uh, neurological deficit. Uh, and then we need a witness if possible. So that's what happened. Happened. Abid, that's why it's yeah. kind of important that it says that patient denied syncope, but had a fall. If we put this together, I have to clarify why the patient fell down. Right. But what, what I'm saying, Rufikba, in this case, the patient was brought in by the EMS, and after a fall, there was nobody to say, and patient doesn't remember. I'm just oh, giving you- Okay, that's important. If the patient does not remember why he fell down, yes, that means he passed out. That is syncope. Yeah. That's yeah. But, but, but I think the history is very important. But after this EKG, we accepted that this is syncope. Oh, no. Yeah. He cannot pass out from this. <laughs> All right. What is this? Okay. I No, we need to bring, we need to bring um, one of the junior doctors uh, who is attending from the audience. Uh, for this ECG. Can we do that, Atar? Hello, yes, sir. Uh, Hello. Yeah. Ribu. Yes, sir. Hello, Ribu. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A any of the attendees who are interested, raise Asa, your hand. Be before that, Govindo can sir. participate. Govindo. Rehan, Rehan, can invite Kora Jyoti Parasar. Yes, Rehan, Rehan, yes, Rehan, Dr. Rehan. Dr. Rehan. Okay, I'm making him panelist, sir. Rehan. Asa, yes, sir. I have made him panelist, sir. He can talk now. Dr. Rehan Asa. can talk now. Asa, he's in the screen. Bring him in the screen. Arshi, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am giving the heart rate. The heart rate is. Uh, or, or even, or even Dr. Kamal Hussain. Kamal Hussain, Ovi, or Rehan, anyone? Okay, sir. I'm bringing Dr. Kamal Hussain, Ovi, also. Dr. Rehan. Yes, sir. Sir. Rehan, do you want to meet on meet? Obi or Rehan? Sir. Assalamualaikum, sir. They're both here, sir. As they a, can talk, I, yes, sir. Open, as a video, as a, open your video, please. Did you like that? Comment code. Sir, is it showing, sir, white complex tachycardia, sir? Uh, sir, uh, most likely, sir, ventricular tachycardia, sir. Let me you describe the morphology and can you morphology of the what is yes. the, where can be the origin of the VT? Interlead axis, concordance or discordance. So here, sir, concordance, sir. Here, uh, uh, sir, QRS complex, sir, uh, B1, B2, B3, B4, sir, so concordance, sir. Uh, Dr. Rehan. Dr. Rehan. Beyond 
ভি ফোর থেকে ভি সিক্স ভি ফাইভ ভি ফোর থেকে ভি সিক্স v6 is negative yeah lead v1 and v2 you can always argue this is the ne- qrs complex this is the qrs so it looks kind of negative however if you look at lead v3 it is very clear it is positive yes, positive. yes. so you know when you look at the v2 it's tough to say which one is qrs but this is the positive part of the qrs because in lead so v3 is not negative so it doesn't fulfill the concordance criteria so any time you look at an ecg look at lead by lead and i appreciate that you were thinking of that term concordance but just carefully look if all of them are negative then it is concordance or all of them positive and i want to also tell the very juniors when you were we say concordant or discordant we mean the chest leads look at yes. this ভেন্ট্রিকুলার কনকর্ডেন্স এখানে <laughs> 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 রেহান <laughs> 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 So let's go point by point. You said Brugada thing, what was it? Sir, first, sir, uh, it is an absence of RS complex in V1. Is, is there absence of RS complex in V1? No, sir, just one second. Don't interfere him. Sir, almost all complex are RS, sir, presence, sir, RS, presence, sir, RS complex presence, sir. Okay. Then we yes, should sir. go to the second okay. point, no, sir. No, 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 please slow down. Yes, sir. You know, in Bangladesh, when I was a medical student, we would just memorize and learn. And then argue about it. So go point by point. So first of all, you decide which is the QRS complex in V1. It is very ugly QRS complex. Yes, sir. And I'm making an assumption. The whole positive thing is the QRS complex. So it's just an R wave. So your Brugada thing doesn't fulfill. What was the next thing you said? So next thing is uh, R2S distance. And where are you measuring it? So measuring, sir, uh, it is... Which lead than... can you measure? Okay. Which lead, which lead has R and S both? Mm, sir. Yes, B. Sir, sir no, B2, just, please, sir. Let him speak. sir v2 which sir one? which lead v2 sir v2 lead v2 okay. lead sir fine all right so you think lead v2 and where is the r wave that tiny positive r wave which is the s wave in lead 2 v2 the ecg is so confusing 
that even yes, for sir. me, it is very difficult to say which is R, which is S. Yes, sir. So, but one lead you can look at. Look at lead V4. V4, yes, sir. Maybe, you know, this dark line, the second line from the dark line from the left is on a positive wave. And maybe that is a small R wave. If that is true, then if you measure from the beginning of that to the deepest point of S wave, it's about 120 millisecond. What I am to tell you, Dr. Rehan, is that theory is important, but then you apply it to the current picture. So maybe that's a possibility. So what do you think is the diagnosis? So ventricular tachycardia, sir. Ventricular, this is this white QRS tachycardia, unless proven otherwise, is ventricular tachycardia. It does not fulfill any of those algorithms that we have learned so far. But one thing is true. If we look at lead V1, lead one, it looks like left bundle. Yes, sir. If it if we look at lead V1, it looks like a right bundle. Yeah. So it doesn't fulfill any of the SVT criteria for bundle brain block. So even if we forget all algorithm, if I see this ECG in the emergency room, my one diagnosis I have is ventricular tachycardia. Uh, unfortunately, it does not, uh, unless somebody has any other comment, it, this doesn't fall into any of our algorithm of this ventricular tachycardia. Comment, Ravik Bhai, last comment you made is the most wonderful comment. If it does not follow anything, it is not quite written that way in the book, but I find it very helpful. And another thing that the Deep QS in the V6 in the goes in favor of BT. Yes. And then the yes. depolarization, early depolarization time is long. So it, that, that means there is muscle to muscle conduction. Yes. Okay, good. So Hafiz, what happened? Sir, can I can I add something? Yes. Uh, look at V4. There is a not in the uh, down slope. They suggest this could be scar related VT. Yes, exactly. So, okay, so Wadu yeah. is going to the next level, uh, like <laughs> where it is coming from and uh, what to do with this. Um, so, this patient lost pulse, CPR initiated, and all that. And this is the post resuscitation. Mamma Mia. Okay. Any comment? I'm not sure about the P waves. Yeah, P wave is present here, sir. Sinus rhythm, LBB morphology, white complex, complete LBB morphology, sinus rhythm. V1 does not fulfill the LBB criteria. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like a bifascicular block type of morphology, actually, by your trifascicular block. But the question is that, uh, mostly if you commit to left bundle, then you commit to left bundle. Uh, then you cannot go any further, right? Uh, yes. I would not invoke, if I am saying left bundle, then I would not invoke by right. I say something. Yeah, Ravik Bhai. First of all, I do not see a P wave. Yeah. <laughs> Number one. Number two, in a very sick patient, the heart rate is less than 60. Yes. It has a bundle branch block, which is not a right bundle, which is not left bundle. It is just a ventricular rhythm. So it's a 
So is it idioventricular rhythm? Idioventricular rhythm. Okay. So how can you uh, uh, explain the morpho in lead one and meeting Yes, and if you look at lead one, it looks like yeah. lead one, right? Yes. But if you look at lead three yeah, six, it does not look like lead bundle. It's so it is, yeah. So it is coming from the ventricle, but it is not uh, a, a any of those uh, right bundle or left bundle pattern because there is no P wave. It is not a junctional rhythm. If it is a junctional rhythm, it will fulfill one of the criteria, either right bundle or left bundle, but it doesn't. That's my, my thinking. Hafiz, any comment? So, <laughs> some of us looking at the I V1, the P wave is there. explain and then say it is artifact. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now this is the EKG after. So this is so important, Rafik, by what you just said, that in a sick patient, when we resuscitate, the immediate post rhythm, don't read too much into this. And mm -hmm. I tell so the fellows that this patient should be tachycardic. But amazingly, this patient is struggling in 50s. Um, but anyway, uh, this was further. And then ultimately, we did the workup. Uh, and the, this patient has a non ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. And the question is should we go for what? Uh, uh, Wadud was saying that should we go for any um, ablation or not? Uh, anybody G. for G. that? G. Bondo G. 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 Of course, it is. Patient is getting ICD, but the question is, and that's what we did. ICD, and we did not go for any ablation for now. But if there is a recurrence of VT shock, then something to think about in future. Right, exactly. Actually, Hafiz, if the patient gets recurrent uh, shock from the ICD, then uh, radio frequency ablation should be considered. Yes. Yeah. Can I ask a question? So this patient gets an ICD, one year later, develops an episode of VT, which is terminated by anti tachycardia pacing or one shot. Will you do an ablation on that patient? No. No, sir. No, sir. And no, why? Sir. As it's not uh, that much frequent. If it is very frequent, then exactly. ablation should be considered. That is the issue. The issue is that if somebody gets one shock a year, or one therapy, I don't think we should ablate. Yes. If somebody is getting frequent episode, and the other thing we have to remember that non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, it is not scar related, they're very difficult to ablate. So we may have to also consider antiarrhythmic treatment before we send this patient for ablation. Yes, sir. And I, this is my last case, a 41 year old with familial dilated cardiomyopathy and then uh, came in with this EKG strip. I have only these two, so you, if you ask me to go back and forth, I'll go back and forth. This is the uh, 12 lead EKG. And there, there you capture these white complexes as we acquire the EKGs. And then this is the rhythm strip. He was put on the ICD before, is it? Yes. He, he she, I think it's she. She, she, she is loaded. Loaded means she's, uh, she has ICD. So the space rhythm we are seeing. So this is VT. Looks like uh, in the this one, this one is the short run VT. And previous on, throughout there was VT.
this is all through VT. Amish bhai, this is VT, any doubt? No, 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 no doubt. But I'm just saying that what to do next? Because uh, oh. I was thinking in terms of what Wadud says in the last case, that, okay, VT, so what's next? She has ICD, she's on this, she's on this, uh, let me show you the medications. She's on Coreg, Etresto, Aldactone, Malta. Oh, she is getting the law. Why is it? Why is this patient on Maltec? <laughs> Perfect, bye. I did not agree. <laughs> so, 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 forty-one. Maltec, how, how, how is the preparation for Maltec? This morning I was thinking. This Ronnie morning, I was, this morning I was thinking that I'm going to put this case adding, and when I see, see this, I said, "You probably would be asking me the questions." So this patient, uh, young, and they don't want to see amiodarone toxicity. Don't kill the messenger. I did not put the patient on Maltec, but let me tell you what is the thinking. The amiodarone have toxicity. Is that, is that, what is what is Maltec? Oh, sorry. Drone drone. 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 Okay. Drone. Uh, so uh, that was the thinking of the cardiologist who who continued the patient on Maltec, and then that is the way she came into us. So this is a problem because what happens is patients who have recurrent ventricular tachycardia and we put them on amiodarone, the nightmare scenario is you develop slow ventricular tachycardia like this patient uh -huh. with a heart rate around uh, its cycle length of 480 milliseconds, so probably 120 or so. So you cannot program the ICD that low. Yeah. What do you do with these patients? If they are not having frequent VT, Stop the medicine, read the tachycardia become faster so that ICD can take care of it. And after that, if the if it is recurrent VT frequent, then ablation is a is a thing to do for this kind of patients. Yeah, so we did Lovik by and the ATP program was like in 150s, you know. So what I did, I stopped the Maltec, I optimized the beta blocker as much as we can, and then I actually referred this. Further inquiring, this patient's sister had a cardiac transplant, and then she has familial dilated cardiomyopathy. So I'm in touch with the um, heart transplant center uh, in San Diego to, to evaluate this patient for that. In the meantime, if there is a recurrence of VT, we can do the uh, ablation, but we are trying to get a cardiac MR and see where is the, uh, the trigger, uh, the um, substrate. All right. That, that's what I have for today. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Excellent. 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 Thank okay. you, sir. Thank 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 you, sir. ECG of the week. For the ECG of the week. By the by the way, uh, I was actually when you were discussing, I was watching CNN headlines. Biden is now projected the president. Oh, good. <laughs> now I, you know what I want? I don't want Trump to leave the White House. <laughs> so the, because I want to see him being dragged out of the White House. And he's <laughs> Sir, there, are some, there are many trolls in the internet. I saw some of them. <laughs> they the, uh, the yes, yes. That's what I want to see. <laughs> there, there was a nice troll that uh, people said that we want the president to change, but we want the first lady to remain the same. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Jill will be one of the most qualified first ladies. She is a she is a PhD holder. Uh, well, sir, this is the ECG? Yeah, this is the ECG. Uh, so this is the ECG. Uh, I think just for uh, one minute, uh, Govindo. I will make presentation with chest pain. 
गोविंदो जी सर हाउ मेनी फाइंडिंग्स यू कैन सी इन दिस ईसीजी ओके सर आई लाइक टू से जंक्शनल रिदम गोविंद Every dissociation, junctional rhythm is okay. Extra yeah. elevation, yeah. Inferior my posterior with pericarditis. Yes. I could say my ST elevation am I? Yeah. Uh, ST elevation lead three and lead two, Joel. Mm -hmm. And also there is a Z point elevation seems to be in the uh, lead V four, V five. Yes. The color why? V two to V five. Okay. Why? Why? Why do you consider uh, pericarditis? Uh, lead two three. If you are taking one of the pericarditis. One two three if you are. Even after the first elevation in pericardial lead. So go with the finally. What are the points? A B dissociation inferior M I. Then what else? In free am I with uh, you already described J point elevation? Yes, J point elevation. Yes. So complication of the pericarditis might be am I with pericarditis? In free or am I, or am I with allergic polarization like this? Na. Yes. Actually, which is I'm considering for it. Rate around seventy five per milli, more or less regular, but there is no P Q R S association. It seems to be related. P going on its own and Q R S going on its own. Yes. Yes. In lead two three F E F, but I don't see any reciprocal change in one F E F. And in the chest leads, we find. There's a torn R and upright T web in V2. Maybe in, uh, in association with inferior, there may be posterior extension. But there is up, but the concavity upwards ST elevation from V2 to V6 with a J point sharp notch. This suggests this could be a little polarization. And as there is every decision with, but the QS not as narrow, so this the the scapism is from junction. So the diagnosis could be acute ST elevated inferior MI with possible posterior extension with complete heart block with junction escape rhythm with early repolarization. Uh, regarding TOF, TOF, tall TOF, can we uh, say? Can you yeah. tell? Yeah. TOF, more than ROF, height. In the AVR, AVR is supporting pericarditis. झमलारे <laughs> But yeah. I would not invoke early report because a on a corrupt social social we are saying not a lot of things going on here. So yeah. the explanation for the tall peak T wave, we need tall, to think about. Yeah. You know, the Shamrock says this acute coronary insufficiency in the LAD territory a separate pathology or not? It may be another separate pathology. We need to keep that in mind, and then. Of course, this patient inferior MI recent is the patient in shock, renal failure, hyperkalemia. Think about that as well. And what Khalid Sovan is saying is important that you also think about in maybe an old old patient. I don't know how old whether there is a transmural pericarditis um, is happening or not. So a lot of things. This is a very concerning EKG.
डाउन Can I say something about this? Yes, sir. Okay. So, a patient with inferior ST elevation, complete heart block. So, no question, that is acute MI. The problem is, we had a similar case that now acute MI we have to give heparin if we want to, and now we have ST elevation in V3, V4, V5, V6, and even though we are discussing all these issues. How How do you know this is not pericarditis? So I give heparin to this patient, and patient develops pericardial effusion. Yes. So the management yeah. is an issue in this patient. Yes. yes. So we had a similar case. What we did is we did an echo, and echo did not show any wall motion abnormality. Still, we were not very happy. We did an angiogram, came back with normal. That patient did not have complete heart block. Um, so it, management wise, I think for all of us, we need to remember that issue of heparin. Issue of pericarditis has to be entertained, and I think Hashi will probably agree that one of the quick solution will be to do an angiogram on this patient and be done with. And the other thing is that my question is why there was no a, a reciprocal changes. The thing is, look at the ST elevation in leg two and leg three. Leg two ST elevation is higher than ST elevation in leg three. That suggests this is LCX involvement. And that also goes in favor that this could be posterior extension could be there, and then the reciprocal change is more likely if the RC is involved, and the reciprocal change best seen in LVL, maybe lead one, but mostly in LVL, and so, most seen involved. What did Marriott uh, describes this LCX versus RCA? I think practically this is not a big debate to. Think about um, the point is that when there is a reciprocal changes and you flip the EKG, you see the ST depression in the precordial leads, and it has to be proportionate. Then you raise the suspicion of inferior posterior extension. But here, uniquely, you see that it goes all the way to like I don't see the six. V5, V6, all the way. So it is. It doesn't look like inferior posterior extension. Looks like to me there is a separate explanation to be given for the precordial uh, changes. So I don't know, but there is no question this patient needs to go to the cath lab. One thing I wanted to share, say, and it is very important: if you do an echo and you see no wall motion in this patient, be aware of VSD and be aware of any significant MR. Because what happens if there is a mechanical complication? The heart tries to recruit everything, and you get a false thing by a quick uh, a bedside echo. Oh, EF good. It should not be fooled. You need to look, keep that in mind that this may be in bigger trouble, particularly if this patient is hypotensive or in pulmonary edema. That means something major catastrophe happening. And the point you have been raising that. To say that there is posterior extension, there should have been ST depression. That should have been present. But here, the all, all the curved ST elevation, uh, the concave, concavity upwards ST elevation, and with the junction notch, that present also from P2 to P6. That's why I'm invoking that the, the, could this be the coexisting early polarization as well, rather than acute uh, actually I mean uh, uh, hyperacute state as well. But this is a very complex, very interesting ECG. That's why it's been given. So, regarding uh, early repolarization, the changes rarely uh, is beyond V4. Not necessarily. You can get in everywhere. No, no it, it, that's not like that. But uh, sometimes V5, V6, maybe. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. There's nothing said like that. 
and then, but look, I don't have the AVL, but lead one AVL complete sparing in early repoll is unusual. Yes, sir. And I don't see that striking thing in lead one AVL. So yeah, that I'm, is still not, that is I'm still not in favor of early repoll as a first diagnosis, but we need to see, do we have any previous EKG or anything? No, but I can tell the history of the patient. Actually, that patient later on, we find out that he, he has acute uh, inferior mind, and there was only an early polarization. There was no posterior involvement. There is possible, but uh, there was not, no posterior involvement. Only inferior MI, sir. Means RCA involvement only. Uh, not necessarily. The PDA it has a complex involvement. Look at this. Remember that epidural supply mostly from uh, uh, 60%, uh, mostly from RCA, but sometimes could be as 6 as well. But it was actually only uh, inferior mind. It's an old ECG, but I remember the patient. With complete heart block, sir. Heart block. Complete heart block. Uh, Firoz. Yeah. Uh, so, one thing I tell you, one thing, that if you see this kind of EKG with uh, precordial leads confusing, I tell the patient to... Impossible previous ECG. Half his time is gone, right? Actually, uh, to take the previous ECG is very much difficult, sir. This issue first, our tropics are said very important. Whether you give TPA or streptokinase uh, or heparin during PCI, first issue to rule out the pericarditis or pericardial, uh, pericardial effusion. Second is uh, two things, always better to include in a single diagnosis. This is the rule in medicine. Inferior MI sometimes may be associated with LED involvement and anterior MI because inferior MI produce hypotension that reduces the flow to the LED producing anterior MI as well. Sometimes type 4 LED uh, causes the inferior and anterior MI, both all MI. LED type 3 or 4. Is it possible that the one AVL had ST elevation initially as a part of early I can because I interrupt the discussion, please? Became... Can I can I interrupt discussion, please? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think what happens, you know, we are all experienced cardiologists. When we discuss all these complex things, it's good for us. For the junior doctor, it gets confusing. Okay. So I think yes, we should keep the message very simple for them. Yes, so that we give them the key points so that they understand the key points. This patient has acute inferior MI with complete heart block. And what will be the basic management? Just as we are talking in the beginning, what to do in my machine, what to do in Soyadpur. Um, that's very, very important also. So let's keep it simple. Thank you, sir. I, I give you an analogy to explain this, what Ravik Bhai said, analogy. So if we are reading CTA of the coronaries and I see high-grade stenosis is one place, I don't look at the other coronaries that much uh, strictly, because what we are trying to do here is to explain the precordial changes. The CTA read, I said, patient needs cast. That means that one area is already putting us in a stake to do, go for the cath, then figure it out. But importantly, if this patient is in sharp, hypotensive, I would request everyone to do a to echo on the way to the cath lab, because if, if possible, because you go to the cath lab, but always good to get an idea with the echo. It is like a stethoscope to understand what's going on with the patient. You may be, don't be surprised in the cat lab. Go to the cat lab in a predictable way. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We are 11.15. Uh, I think we should uh, finish the session today. And thank you, uh, Rafiq Ahmed, sir, and Professor Choudhury Asan, sir. Uh, may I request Atharsa to wrap up the program? I think uh, uh, I am very much happy to thanks our participants for whom this program and thanks uh, because as because uh, although the program is too long, but still they are with us, our participants. Thank you. Uh, thanks all the participants for being with us and all the pa panelists for active participation today's 
discussion, particularly Khaled Morshin, Gobindu, Asadus Zaman, Jamil, all the panelists. And oh. I also happy to thanks Choudhury, Abdul Wadud Choudhury for showing such a good ACC and initiating excellent discussion regarding this ACC. But finally, we should remember the final comment of Rupi Khamet, sir. What is the message? So although the, we initiated the discussion, but we will finally remember the message of Rupi, sir. And I also like to thank Choudhury Hafiz Bhai. Today's ECC and discussion was very, very excellent. I, I must uh, congratulate you for this good session. And we must, I am, uh, this is uh, also, we must thanks our Rufik sir that we have, this, that is uh, many of my confusions uh, is clear today as because sir shows some of the important issues regarding the pacemaker indication. And thanks Begzimko for helping all the session and all the days. Rivu and others uh, big, big, big to participate. So, Firoz, thank you, thank you very much. It is, you are the last person to give uh, receive the thanks. You are the moderator, and I think <laughs> thank you, sir. It's an no excellent problem. announcement, sir. Uh, the next Saturday, it is Dr. Abdullah Jamil. Our audience will be the children, not the adult. That is the children. That is the uh, ECG of the <laughs> Dr. Abdullah Jamil. Next Saturday. What Atom? is the topic next week? So is is <clears throat> normal and abnormal. Normal and abnormal in children. Oh yeah. my God, that's a difficult topic. Yes, sir. <laughs> no, <that's> <laughs> I'm <good>. puzzled. <laughs> in the lecture. We should invite some pediatric cardiologists. We will yeah. vehemently. Can yeah. you <laughs> ask uh, Dr. Fat, uh, uh, Dr. Fatima? Nur, na, Fatima? Uh, uh, Firoz. Yeah. Because if the Tumi actor won't recognize, we should invite some of our pediatric cardiologists. You are this way. Nurunar, Fatima, Abdul Salah, Abdul Abdul we should invite and OJ. I'll be asking them all. Then they should be the panelists in our next session. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, sir. We have learned a lot. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. To the awesome sir, Rafiq Ahmed sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, moderator. Thank you, sir. Obi Rehan, thank you. Obi Rehan, yes, sir. Khaled, we want to see you in every day. <laughs> <laughs>